It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephanie Dugan. Uh, Dr. Dugan received her PhD in immunology from Harvard University, where she studied lipid antigen presentation by CD1D and NKT cell development. She then performed a post postdoctoral fellowship with Hide Plo at the Whitehead Institute, where she became adept in somatic cell nuclear transfer and embryo manipulation uh, for the purpose of generating transnuclear CRISPR genome modified mice. Dr. Dugan joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School and Dana Farber Cancer Institute in 2014, where her lab uses unique mouse models to study the immune response to tumors. She's particularly interested in tumors that do not induce a CD8 T cell response at baseline, and has been using pancreatic cancer as a model to develop new immunotherapies for non T cell infiltrated tumors. Dr. Dugan is a Pew Stewart, uh, Pew Stewart Scholar in Cancer Research a Bill and Melinda Gates Global Health Innovator Scholar, a Melanoma Research Alliance Young Investigator, and received a Pathway to Leadership Award from the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and AACR. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephanie Dugan. Well, thank, thank you for that kind introduction and the invitation to speak today. So I, I will be talking about how to generate immunity to some recalcitrant cancers. And just to um, stress up, okay, there are my disclosures. So this question, um, can the immune system fight cancer, is actually, I think, a very relevant one to start with. So we have T cells, B cells, our, our entire immune system is geared to fight pathogens. And I know we've heard quite a bit about uh, fighting infectious disease earlier in this conference. This is really what, what T cells are for. And so the question, can they actually recognize and kill cancer cells, which are essentially your body's own self cells with very minor modifications, um, really wasn't uh, fully answered in humans until 2010 when we had the first successful trial of uh, an agent ipilimumab, this is an antibody against CTLA-4, that showed that in fact, to our surprise, the majority, or not the majority, but many, many more cancer patients than we expected actually had T cell responses at baseline that could be reinvigorated to fight their cancer. And in fact, you see this is a curve for metastatic melanoma, where about 20% of the patients had these long-term durable remissions, and 10, 15 years out now, they are still cancer-free. And so this led to the idea that cancer was, in fact, maybe not so different from a, a viral infection, in that you could have some tumor cells um, that were dying and, and releasing antigens, or things that could be seen by the immune system. And these would be picked up by dendritic cells that would go to the draining lymph node to prime uh, naive T cells that would then be able to expand and traffic back through the blood to the tumor where they could recognize some of these cancer cells and then effectively kill them. And if we think about it, there are many steps in this process where, of course, the uh, cycle could break down. And these antibodies that we have, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1, uh, colloquially referred to as checkpoint blockade, operate at these final steps where you have effective T cell responses that are uh, blocked in this final stage of tumor killing. And if this could be de-inhibited, then we could effectively uh, cure these cancers. Of course, this assumes that, in fact, uh, T cell priming already occurred. So these upstream processes are happening in many more people than we had expected um, back before 2010. And, and this is, in fact, how we can now get effective responses with cancer immunotherapy. And so this checkpoint blockade has had some fantastic successes, most notably in melanoma, but actually across a wide range of malignancies shown in this nice uh, review recently in the New England Journal. But it's also had some spectacular failures. And so this is where my lab is really focused on, you know, people who have more going on uh, than just this final 
uh, T cells infiltrating into the tumor but are blocked at the last stages of tumor cell killing. And so we've really focused on pancreatic cancer as a model of these poorly immunogenic, very recalcitrant tumors uh, where we have not had uh, any success as of late with therapies aimed at reinvigorating T cell responses. And so using pancreatic cancer now as a model, we looked deeper into the microenvironment and asked, you know, what is really going on in this disease? And so in this diagram, I show you we have tumor cells here in the center, which actually orchestrate most of the, uh, the microenvironment response. And so the cancer itself will secrete cytokines and chemokines that recruit a lot of this uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment. And so I have GMCSF listed here. They also make CXCL1. Both of these call in neutrophils and monocytes from circulation, which are and, and actually increase their production in the bone marrow as well so that you get this influx of these innate immune cells, which we typically think of as fighting off uh, pathogens, but as this cancer is growing and smoldering for you know, many months and years, um, these neutrophils and monocytes eventually uh, you know, abort the attempt to destroy the pathogen and revert to a more wound healing phenotype. And so they end up turning into these granulocytic and monocytic uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells, which are very effective at suppressing uh, T cell responses and they promote the tumor growth. There's also a very robust fibroblast interaction um, with the tumor cells and with the immune cells. And you have at least two kinds of fibroblasts that produce a lot of extracellular matrix and produce um, cytokines like IL-6, which can actually promote the tumor cell growth. And so all of this is really promoting the cancer cells growth and survival and preventing the CD8 T cells from ever getting into this environment. Just to show you how this happens on, on real patient data, um, so this is looking at peripheral blood from a healthy person and from a person with pancreatic cancer. And you can see what I was talking about with the cancer actually increasing production of these innate immune cells. That There's a population here of um, the CD115 CCR2 uh, negative cells that are these expanded immature um, myeloid cells that increase in the circulation of cancer patients. And this is what seeds the tumor. So these cells are going directly into the tumor microenvironment where they form this very massive population of immunosuppressive myeloid cells uh, to the detriment of, of T cells. And so there are almost no T cells in here, also almost no NK cells. Alpha, beta, we couldn't even detect, so they're, they're not on this plot. And so given this, um, there was a thought that maybe we could just deplete these myeloid cells and fix the problem. And so there are many ongoing strategies to deplete myeloid cells, um, several drugs that block their influx, um, also drugs that block their survival. And this is a, a nice example, I think, of uh, one of the best of these strategies, looking at chemotherapy um, plus a CCR2 inhibitor. And in locally advanced uh, pancreatic cancer, so this is pancreatic cancer that is not spread yet beyond the pancreas, but has unfortunately occluded the blood vessels uh, to prevent surgery. And so many of these patients experienced marked reductions, um, and, and quite a number of them were able to then go on to have surgery um, where they were previously ineligible. And so this is a very, a very big success um, for the field. And then there are a few strategies that are aimed at reprogramming these myeloid cells, which is a bit more interesting of a take on the problem um, where you can activate them with an agonist antibody to CD40. And this takes these myeloid cells that are already there en masse in the tumor and reprograms them to become more of these pathogen fighting uh, tumor or myeloid cells. And so you can take macrophages that were um, encouraging tumor growth and get them to become tumoricidal. And so you can see that, that we actually decrease the fibrosis. I mean, you can show that macrophages are in fact uh, engulfing tumor cells in this situation. 
And so although these look like promising strategies, they tend to be very short lived. And this is the major issue with targeting myeloid cells alone when you're only targeting one arm of the immune system, um, that it is not a long term solution. And so what happens when the patients go off of these drugs, um, the tumor just comes right back. And so as a bridge to surgery, they may be effective, but for long term uh, durable remissions, uh, we need, in fact, to get uh, memory T cells. And so this was shown by a very nice study um, published in 2017 looking at patients who had long-term survival. This is not a large group of people, but the very uh, rare patients who are able to survive um, with, with uh, you know, five plus years of follow-up every one of them had memory T cells um, in their blood that were able to recognize that original cancer. And so you have these T cells with antigen-specific memory that are going around and preventing any new cancer uh, from forming. And so this has really led to the question, you know, how do we generate memory T cell responses, not just for these rare long-term survivors, but for the majority of patients? And so we've thought a lot um, as in the field about what kinds of antigens might be recognized by the immune system. So I started by telling you that cancer is very much like your normal self cells with very few differences. Um, and so some of these, of course, are you know, point mutations in amino acids um, or in, in the sequence of proteins that can actually be presented um, on MHC to T cells. And these are so-called tumor neoantigens. And so if people have these, these tend to be the ones that are responding to checkpoint blockade. They tend to have very good T cell responses at baseline, but this unfortunately is not everybody. And so when we're thinking about people who are not responding to current therapies, and when we're thinking about the majority of pancreatic cancer patients, we, we may be left looking at some of these kinds of antigens. Um, ones that are overexpressed uh, developmental antigens, um, ones that are, are self antigens that may have you know, some degree of tolerance, and the T cells that recognize them are not necessarily very high affinity. And so everybody has these, um, and if this is what we've got, this is what we need to work with. So we've thought about this and said, okay, well, you know, they are, they are kind of low affinity, but could, could we get something out of that? And so when I was uh, a postdoc, I learned how to clone mice by somatic cell nuclear transfer. The process is shown here. And some of the mice that we made were actually against a melanoma self-antigen. And so this is a, a tyrosinase-related protein one. It's part of the melanin production pathway. And so we made two lines of mice uh, that recognized the self-antigen with either very low affinity or very high affinity. And so we could show in vitro that this affinity for antigen differed by a hundredfold. So these guys were almost undetectable in their response um, to the antigen in vitro. But when we put them back into tumor bearing mice, we found this surprising result that the low affinity T cell receptors were, were just as good um, as the high affinity ones, or, or just as poor, depending on whether you're optimist or pessimist. Um, but as you can see here uh, in this, this last example, we have you know, mice that have melanoma, and we transfer in uh, CD8 T cells that are either these high affinity or low affinity, and these are overlapping curves. So both groups experienced a weak um, survival benefit, uh, but then of course they, uh, they still uh, die at the same rate. And so, Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just a quick note: if you change your pointer under the slides from private to pointer, it might be easier to point to the graphs. Uh, oh. oh, now we see it. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So this led to a major question that's been uh, driving the the research focus of our lab: is how do we augment priming and function of these lower affinity T cells? So we firmly believe that these could be useful, um, but that they may need uh, some additional assistance in uh, priming and recruiting them to the anti-tumor uh, response. Um, So one way that you can do this is uh, by using a combination of radiation and immune agonist. And so we published this recently. I'll just show you one slide on it, 
we are we were looking at local radiation of mice that have two tumors and we irradiate one of them and then uh, use that uh, radiation induced cell damage um, that would actually cause antigen release and uptake by dendritic cells. And the dendritic cells, we helped out a little bit with this agonistic anti-CD40. Um, and this really induced very vigorous T cell priming. So all of these mice uh, were cured initially. And then we can take the cured mice and we can re-challenge them with pancreatic cancer. Um, and they regress these tumors. If we deplete T cells from these cured mice, within the tumors grow progressively. And if we take T cells um, from these cured mice and transfer them into new mice that we challenge with pancreatic cancer, we can show that the T cells alone are enough to confer protection. And in fact, these, this T cell priming was so vigorous um, that we actually induced uh, vitiligo in the mice. And so these mice didn't have melanoma. This is a pancreatic cancer model. But when we irradiated the, the tumor growing under the skin, we even induced priming of T cells against uh, skin antigens. And you can see here that um, you can find in the vitiligo skin, there are CD8 T cells here in pink that are uh, clustering in the hair follicles where they've uh, killed off these melanocytes. And so this, um, this I think, is one, one path forward. Another path forward that I want to explain a little more um, extensively, uh, because this is um, largely unpublished now, is looking at augmenting coast emulation. And so uh, many of the coast emulatory molecules in the immune system belong to a family called this TNF family of receptors, and where TNFR is, is the canonical member. But if you look at it, these other ones, CD27, 41 bb Gitter, OX40, and these are all uh, co-stimulatory molecules on uh, largely T cells, but also other cells in the immune system. And they signal via uh, this pathway. So they associate with uh, TRAF2 and TRAF3, and also CIP1 and 2, which are E3 ubiquitin ligases that constitutively ubiquitinate NIC, keeping NIC levels very low in the cell. And so this is, um, a NIC is a kinase that starts the alternate end of kappa B pathway uh, and would end up transcribing or and ending up producing NF kappa B target genes, and namely cytokines. So this is generally low. When you have binding uh, to this receptor, CIP1 and 2 dissociate, thus allowing NIC to uh, accumulate and this pathway to go forward. So you can mimic this with drugs, and so we have small molecule antagonists of the IAPs, which um, act uh, to constitutively activate this pathway so that even in the absence of ligand, um, you have this co-stimulatory signal. And so what this does is on T cells, it enhances their activation, proliferation, and cytokine production. You can see this in mouse T cells um, that proliferate more, shown here by CFSC dilution and they produce more cytokines only in response, uh, only when they also have signaling through the T cell receptor. And so this is, um, if you take the, the flat bars here, are T cells treated with IP antagonists alone, nothing happens. Um, but if they also get anti-CD3 signaling, you can see an increase in cytokine production. So this was really important to show that we were augmenting co-stimulation, not just overtly uh, activating T cells. And we see the same thing in human T cells as well. Um, and this is showing a Western blot for CIP2, uh, showing that this is actually part of the natural signaling pathway using uh, Gitter um, as one example here. You see that when we stimulate through uh, Gitter, um, with this agonistic antibody, you already get this degradation of CAP1 and 2, indicating that the, the drugs are actually just enhancing the natural signaling pathway um, as it already exists. And so because these uh, TNF family receptors are all over the immune system, treatment with these IP antagonists enhances the function of many different immune cells. So B cells become growth factor independent. Dendritic cells become better antigen presenting cells. They express IL-12. They um, upregulate class two and co-stimulatory molecules. And CD4, CD8, also NKT cells not shown here, um, proliferate more and make more cytokines. 
And so we wondered whether we could use this um, global augmentation of close simulation uh, to enhance our immunity to these very recalcitrant cancers. And so we looked in pancreatic cancer, and here I am just showing you an in vitro system where we took pancreatic cancer cells in a dish. There's no immune system here at all. Um, and if we add these drugs, uh, nothing at all happens. Um, and even when we put them in combination with TNF-alpha, uh, you see no, absolutely no effect on tumor cell growth. So these drugs are not appearing to target the cancer cells. When we put them into immunocompetent mice, however, so this is a mouse that has a fully uh, competent immune system, you can see that these, um, these are subcutaneous pancreatic tumors that grow out progressively, but when you treat the mice with these IP antagonists, uh, the tumors regress. You can take these cured mice, you can rechallenge them with tumors, they're all protected, um, and if you take the spleens from these rechallenged mice, you can find a tumor-specific uh, interferon gamma-producing T cells by LA-SPOT. So this is really demonstrating that we have uh, generated a T cell response and established immunologic memory. We can also grow pancreatic tumors in the pancreas, and all the data I'll show you from here on out um, are, are with uh, tumors in the pancreas of the mouse. So those are implanted by, by surgery. And we can show that the IAP antagonists um, actually are, are fairly beneficial on their own. And when you combine them with a checkpoint blockade, anti pdl one PD-1, CTLA-4, it doesn't really matter which one you use. You actually have cured mice um, in each of these settings. And so we were very excited about this. Um, However, this slide also shows something that is one a major limitation is that if you look at checkpoint blockade alone, it actually did fairly well in this model. And I started by telling you that this is not the case in people, um, that people are very unresponsive to checkpoint blockade and they have pancreatic cancer. And so this has really led our lab to um, examine our models carefully. And so we've developed a whole panel of mouse models spanning the diversity of human pancreatic cancer. And I think this is an important point when you're trying to extrapolate mouse data to human data. And so you know, we have a couple of cell lines that are you know, fairly highly mutated. They generate pretty good T cell responses at baseline, and they look like the 1% of pancreatic cancer patients who are MSI high um, and do respond to checkpoint blockade. All the data I'll show you now are from this, um, these last three panels where they have very, very few CD8 T cell infiltrates at all, um, and they have no response to PD-1 blockade. Yet, they still show partial response to IAP antagonists, and this is what really gets us excited about it. And this is one example to really show you here. These are two different pancreatic cell lines sequenced to show that they have no neoantigens um, that we could find, and they have zero response to uh, PD-1 blockade shown here. However, you get a 50% reduction in tumor size with the IAP antagonist, so I'm showing that we are, we are doing something better at the checkpoint blockade in T cell cold tumors. This also works in the setting of metastasis. So these are uh, tumor cells that have been injected into the hemispleen, and so they seed the liver. And you can show that, in fact, we are able to um, greatly reduce the burden in the liver as well. So this is not restricted just to the pancreas. And it also combines fairly well with standard of care gemcitabine. Um, so not every uh, Immunotherapy does equally well with chemotherapy. You think you're killing rapidly dividing cells. T cells are rapidly dividing cells. Um, and so we do think it's very important, even in these early preclinical stages, to make sure that the drugs that we're inducing immune responses with are not uh, counterindicated with standard of care. So we wanted to know how these were operating. And to do this, we treated a wide variety of mice. Um, and so these are all of a, a T cell low pancreatic cancer cell line um, implanted into the pancreas. And if you put this into wild type mice, um, you get this very nice 50% uh, reduction in tumor burden. If you put these same cells into mice that lack cross-presenting dendritic cells or that lack CD8 T cells or that lack T cells and B cells, 
you see that there's absolutely no effect of the drug, indicating that, in fact, cross-presenting dendritic cells and CDAT cells are absolutely required in order to get um, an effect of this uh, immunotherapy. CD4 cells and B cells were less important. This is to show you again in a different model, um, slightly more uh, rigorous. These are live passage organoids. If you implant them into wild type mice, you get a very nice reduction in tumor size um, with these IAP antagonists. If you put them into TCR alpha knockout mice that lack alpha beta T cells, you have absolutely no response. So again, we know that alpha beta T cells are exquisitely required for this response to IAP antagonists. But when we looked in the tumors for where are the alpha beta T cells, right? This is a flow cytometry uh, data quantified here. You can see that we get a ton of these myeloid derived suppressor cells. It's the majority of what's in the cancer. Um, and almost no alpha beta T cells. So CD8 cells, CD4 cells are hovering here at 1%. And when we look in the drug-treated mice, they're still at 1%. So how is this even happening? Um, and so we scratched our heads about this for a little while, and we said, well, maybe they're just you know, much, much better T cells. Um, and so we were able to uh, sort enough of these rare CD4 and CD8 T cells. It's not zero, it's 1%. And so we sorted these out and looked by RNA-seq to ask, you know, what, are, what are they doing? Um, and gratifyingly, we could see that uh, TNF signaling via NF-kappa-B comes up as a major pathway um, upregulated, uh, indicating that these are likely the cellular targets of our drug, right? This is the pathway we know our drug induces. Um, and then we also see that they are highly, highly proliferative and expressing a lot of MYC target genes. And so these seem to be um, maybe rapidly dying, but also very rapidly proliferating um, and uh, highly uh, active effector cells. To show you in a bit more rigorous of a model, these are not implanted. These are spontaneously arising pancreatic tumors um, in a, a conditional mouse that expresses uh, KRAS and loss of P53 only in the pancreas. This is a very aggressive tumor where these mice are, are enrolled um, after they have ultrasound confirmed tumors of two millimeters in diameter or larger. And at that point, the mice die with the median of nine days. And so this is very rapidly fatal. Not a lot of time to generate an immune cell response to NOVO. And yet we see that our um, IAP antagonist treated mice are able uh, to double survival in this highly aggressive model. Not a huge benefit of adding PD-1 blockade in terms of survival. But when we looked at what was happening in these mice, um, we saw something very interesting. And so the panels on the left here are looking by Mason's trichrome staining, where the blue is extracellular matrix. And you can see that these tumors are highly, highly fibrotic. Um, this is very uh, uh, indicative of, of pancreatic cancer. And so um, treatment with our IP antagonist really didn't change that. We still see the same amount of fibrosis. But what we did see that was very surprising was the in induction of these tertiary lymphoid structures. So here we're staining for T cells in pink, B cells in brown, and you start to see these little follicles. Um, now, this is not the majority of the cancer, right? This is one little corner, and the cancer is this huge, you know, white mess. So it's not, this isn't more T cells. This is just that they've clustered into a tertiary lymphoid structure. And you can see that you almost never find them in vehicle-treated mice, but we can see them induced with IAP antagonists and induced even more with PD-1 blockade. And so these are some pictures of the combination treated mice that have these beautiful tertiary lymphoid structures. And I think that this is showing that, in fact, we have successfully induced T cell priming. Um, and this may be a starting point for additional combination therapy. So these are little centers um, that are producing uh, you know, activated T cells and, and antibodies coming out of these uh, miniature germinal centers. So just to end with a model of what we think is happening, we have pancreatic tumors growing in this tumor nest surrounded by fibrosis and immunosuppressive myeloid cells. We need some source of cell death. And so this could be with chemotherapy, radiation, a cell-based vaccine. Um, and so we've tried all of these and shown it doesn't really matter how you kill some cancer cells. 
but this allows these tumor antigens to be taken up by dendritic cells that then go to the draining lymph node. And so our drugs um, increase uh, MHC class 1 and 2 expression, they increase trafficking, they increase IL-12 production and co-stimulation, so these are much better dendritic cells. And then the T cells that are being primed also are having this boost to priming, um, increased proliferation, increased cytokine production, so that you basically have this 1-2 punch to T cell priming, and now we can recruit many more of these uh, possibly low affinity cells now being activated where they wouldn't have been otherwise, uh, going back to the tumor and inducing uh, an immune response. So um, with that, I will uh, notice that I have some questions in the comments field. Um, so I'll just put up my acknowledgments, and I will say, um, okay, I'll just read this. So from Dr. Fish, Dr. Dugan, have you examined these IP antagonists in fully immunocompetent mice for activity against any pathogens such as viruses? This is a really interesting question, and so, you know, we've um, mostly focused on cancer immunology, but of course you could ask, you know, this is a general um, adjuvant, uh, essentially, and so uh, would this um, be a good thing to boost uh, a pathogenic uh, vaccines against pathogens? And I say that this is actually being tried, so the, the drug company that makes these, uh, you know, is looking at this. Um, it's not something my lab has done, but they do um, seem to have activity in terms of uh, ad general adjuvants for pathogen-based vaccines. Okay. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Treg response in this model of pancreatic cancer? Um, yes, so we uh, find very few Tregs in, in our mouse models. They are there. They're there at higher frequency than the CD8, so that's um, obviously not, not optimal. And when we look at the effect of these drugs, um, these IAP antagonists on Tregs, it's very interesting, and so um, this is uh, somewhat preliminary, but we show that we can actually block the conversion of uh, Tregs um, from CD4, naive CD4 T cells. So if you try to induce Treg conversion with TGF-beta um, in vitro in the presence of IP antagonists, uh, they will not upregulate FOXP3, and even if you take FOXP3 positive cells and you treat them with IP antagonists, they'll downregulate FOXP3. Um, so there is some precedent in the literature looking at the effect of OX40, OX40 ligand on suppressing FOXP3 activity, and I think that that's actually a pathway that, that we've activated. So this is um, that's a TNF family receptor, and I think that we have uh, we've actually recapitulated that OX40 story with our small molecule. So definitely could be contributing. Um, the last question I see is how does the IP antagonist compare to anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 in terms of autoimmune side effects? That is an excellent question. Um, and so you could imagine that we have, a, you know, by de-inhibiting or by augmenting co-stimulation, we might increase autoimmunity. Um, I will say that these drugs have been tried in people. They've gotten to phase two trials already, and the... Um, they do induce a little bit of a cytokine, uh, not, not a full cytokine storm, but cytokine levels go up uh, initially in treated patients, but it's very manageable. And so there have not been um, very many toxicities in humans seen on uh, treatment with these drugs, partly because you can dose them fairly infrequently, and so, you know, it's a once-weekly dose, um, which, which does help. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, we are... We're, we're only augmenting co-stimulation, and so you're not activating all T cells. These drugs have not been tried in people who have underlying autoimmunity, and I think that that would actually be a really dangerous population to put them in, um, but I think the, the people who have been treated with them have, have done quite well. Um, Maybe okay. one last question uh, is, for these populations of especially the CD4 cells, have you uh, looked at KLRG1 or ST2 or these kind of markers to see if these are, you know, uh, infiltrating cells from uh, lymph nodes or if they're locally cells that are uh, expanding? And also, are IL-10 producing B cells a problem at all uh, with the pancreatic line you're looking at? Um, okay, so there there is a connection between um, B cell, IL-10, uh, actually an IL-35 producing B cells in development of pancreatic cancer. 
um, that doesn't seem to be playing as big a role in established pancreatic cancer. And when we put these tumors into MUMT mice that lacked B cells, we didn't really see, uh, you know, an, any change from, from wild type mice in terms of the effect of the drug. So I think B cells are not necessarily playing an important role, although finding these beautiful tertiary lymphoid structures does, uh, you know, bring up in, to mind um, induction of an antibody response. So I won't say we've completely ruled it out. And then your question about uh, KLRG1 expression, um, we have, we looked at a little bit by flow cytometry. I think it's a little more clear from the RNA-seq data uh, that we are getting um, expression of KLRG1 upregulated on, on T cells after uh, treatment with these IP antagonists. And so they do seem to be um, be better activated uh, effector cells. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting talk. Really appreciate your time. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, bring up my colleague Anastasia Montagne, who can introduce our next speaker. Thank you again. Have a good for your time. Thanks.